I'm very glad, uh, glad to uh, uh, present my paper research about the labor cooperation between Vietnam and Thailand. Um, as you know, labor is one of the increasingly important domain uh, of, cooperation, uh, of uh, cooperation among Southeast Asian countries, particularly given that the uh, Asian community has uh, entered into force. Um, and uh, labor has also been the most prominent issue in the relation between Vietnam and Thailand, uh, especially since it was uh, highlighted uh, as one of the uh, successful uh, field of cooperation uh, in the 2014-2018 um, uh, plan of action um, to implement the strategic partnership between the two countries. Um, my uh, people will uh, concentrate on the situation of labor cooperation between Vietnam and Thailand uh, recently and give some uh, recommendations to uh, promote uh, this uh, bilateral cooperation. Um, first uh, is the generation uh, situation. Um, Thailand is uh, in the shortage uh, of qualified, skilled, and uh, um, general workers uh, in many sectors. Uh, Thailand has attracted a large number of foreign workers from many countries in the world um, since the early um, 1990s. Uh, Thailand has attracted uh, workers with low wage from uh, neighboring countries uh, like uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, uh, and um, Thai government signed the Memorandum of Understanding on uh, Labor Cooperation uh, with Laos uh, in uh, 2002. Uh, with uh, Cambodia and Myanmar uh, one year later. Uh, about Vietnam, uh, since the 1980s, uh, Vietnam's national social economic development plans have uh, included labor migration as a policy mechanism to increase uh, employment and uh, reduce uh, poverty. Uh, one of the major contributing factors to the uh, growth in official labor migration flows from Vietnam has been the licen licensing uh, of both state-owned and um, private recruitment agencies. Uh, today, there are an, about, an estimated about uh, 500,000 Vietnamese workers uh, living abroad. Uh, the means uh, The means uh, by which Vietnamese workers migrate uh, has become more varied and uh, complex. Uh, an increasing number of Vietnamese workers are now employed through independent or uh, irregular means. Uh, independent migrants are recruited uh, outside the uh, parameter of memorandum of understanding on labor migration between governments and uh, without using a recruitment agency. Uh, some irregular workers also undertake employment in the absence of a valid working permit, uh, overstaying their visa, or breaching uh, visa conditions in order to gain employment. Uh, currently, uh, there are about um, 50,000 Vietnamese workers in Thailand uh, working in uh, simple industries such as uh, um, uh, restaurant, um, domestic servant, uh, sell leaves, uh, potters, or uh, slave during. Uh, this is uh, the number of citizens that uh, take advantage of the agreement on uh, visa exemption uh, for ordinary passport of uh, 30 days was signed between the two countries. Uh, most of them are unskilled workers with income, uh, with a low income at the average of about 10,000 uh, baht per month. Uh, and, um, Thanh Hóa and Hà Tĩnh uh, are two provinces that have many workers migrant, uh, migrant to Thailand, uh, estimated over, about um, 6,000 people. Uh, overland routes through Laos, for example, through Lao Bao or uh, Via Thác Hệ into Mục Đà Hàn and uh, into Bangkok are the primary means of entering Thailand. Uh, in general, the work and life is uh, a Vietnamese worker in Thailand is uh, unstable, risky, and uh, neg negatively impacts to security and social order of Thailand. 
about the labor cooperation between uh, Vietnam and Thailand. Um, labor cooperation between Vietnam and Thailand in uh, recent years has obtained some uh, progress um, in which Thailand has uh, supported quite much uh, for Vietnamese uh, workers. Um, in order to um, uh, help and manage the Vietnamese uh, workers, um, the illegal Vietnamese workers in Thailand, uh, the Thai cabinet passed passed a resolution on Vietnamese labor management uh, in February 2015. Uh, according to the resolution, uh, Vietnam's labor uh, will have a new work to a maximum of one year uh, in Thailand. Um, and uh, these people have to register within one month from uh, September uh, the 1st, uh, 2015, uh, six registration points. Uh, however, few people meet the uh, resolutions uh, regulation. Uh, to strengthen the labor uh, cooperation between Vietnam and Thailand, uh, on the 27th of July 1950, uh, 2015, uh, Vietnam and Thailand signed a memorandum of understanding uh, on labor cooperation uh, as well as uh, the agreement about dispatching and receiving labor between two countries. The um, uh, memorandum of uh, understanding about the labor cooperation is a basis uh, to uh, um, strengthen the cooperation relation between uh, Vietnam and uh, Thailand. Um, the content of uh, MOU includes uh, nine articles, uh, including uh, the um, specific cooperation fields, labor method, and uh, cooperation principle. Uh, on the other hand, agreement um, about dispatching and uh, receiving labor is a legal framework for Vietnam worker uh, working in Thailand. Uh, this uh, agreement includes uh, 15 articles uh, in, um, about the rights and uh, responsibility of employee, the em of, uh, employer, the dispatching and receiving labor process, and the employment contract, visa license, etc. The signing of uh, uh, the MOU on labor cooperation and the agreement on uh, sending uh, and labor receiving between Vietnam and Thailand will open up uh, employment opportunities uh, for Vietnam to work legally in Thailand. Uh, this is the legal framework uh, for the operation of labor uh, sending Vietnam to work um, legally and also the uh, basis to project uh, to protect the rights and uh, legitimate interests of labor Vietnam and uh, of uh, Vietnamese labor to work in this country. Uh, after signing the MOU and the agreement about dispatching and receiving labor, the two governments uh, have worked hard to uh, implement the contents through uh, regular meetings and uh, exchange. Uh, to uh, get a consensus um, uh, to uh, create favorable conditions for the Vietnamese labor migrants uh, in Thailand. Uh, and um, uh, in November past year, a new re 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 resolution of labor management um, was passed. Uh, that is the re regulations before um, in which um, allow all Vietnamese workers uh, to stay to work in the industry uh, that um, they are working in one year trans uh, transitional period uh, and allow the Thai construction and fishing enterprise uh, to uh, recruit a Vietnamese worker immediately uh, without requiring them uh, uh, come back to Vietnam. Uh, up to now, Thailand is due to working permits to over uh, 1,500 uh, Vietnamese workers uh, in uh, construction, domestic, uh, and uh, restaurant areas. Uh, the number is uh, relatively small, but uh, it reflects uh, the two countries' efforts uh, to strengthen the cooperation in labor. Uh, <coughs> uh, and I give uh, some conclusion. Uh, about the um, labor cooperation. Uh, 
um, labor cooperation between Vietnam and Thailand has uh, obtained uh, some uh, achievement in uh, recent years. However, compared to other cooperation areas, labor cooperation remains modest and uh, slow. Uh, and uh, the second is uh, the Thailand side MOU with Vietnam uh, mainly to manage illegal migration, migration workers from Vietnam and uh, the recruitment of carriers are limited only in uh, two industries, uh, construction and uh, fishing that do not attract Vietnamese workers uh, due to low wage and uh, their low skilled levels. And um, uh, to uh, promote the um, cooperation uh, between two countries in labor, um, I uh, give some uh, recommendations. Uh, the first, appointing the first uh, the focal recruiting agencies as soon as possible in order to help Vietnamese workers to uh, register to work in Thailand. And the second is uh, extending the industry receiving Vietnamese workers. And the last one is building employment regulations, training and uh, developing uh, labor resource uh, extra. That's all my presentation. Thank you for attention. So this is actually part of um, uh, my work. I have collaborated the the Tamasat Southeast Asia Center, Southeast Asia Study Center, has collaborated with the ASEAN Center at Chiang Mai University, and then we produce. We are producing a YouTube video and um, some of some sort of new media. Uh, in order to show you how ASEAN actually has worked on the ground. So we have talked a lot about how ASEAN as an organization is working. We don't really know how ASEAN actually impacts people on the ground. So this program um, is called uh, ASEANscape. Um, you can probably go and Google it. Unfortunately, we don't really have a subtitle in, in English yet. So it's all in Thai. But we try to tell you how actually um, how this kind of um, labor movement, people movement across the border actually impact um, local people on border area or probably people along the road, along the highway that connect ASEAN countries. And this episode, we have done the first episode exploring the border areas around Thailand, bordering Laos, bordering um, Myanmar. Unfortunately, we didn't do the, the um, uh, the part bordering Cambodia. But this episode, which is going to be launched um, very soon, we have already done um, filming the the roads and the highways. We are in the stage of writing them down, trying to finalize the video and clip and so on and so forth. This episode, we're actually exploring the R9 highway. So basically, east-west corridor. We have done um, the road trip from uh, Thailand, from from Thailand to um, Malameng in, in Myanmar. And the second part of the trip, we've done a trip from um, Mukdahan to, to Da Nang. So we actually separate in two trips, and when we, see, we saw a lot of differences between um, the east-west corridor on the west side and the east-west corridor on the east side. However, I can still see the commonality, um, although, albeit the different um, levels of development in Myanmar and Laos and Vietnam, but the common commonality is that it's actually not going to be as planned on paper. Uh, what we have read so far on ADB, um, AB, uh, the Asian Development Bank ADB paper, and probably reports from a lot of international organization never being you know, translated in what actually happened on the ground. And I will actually tell you and show you how it is actually happening on the ground. And is it actually because of the R9 that create these changes? Um, I don't really have the answer myself yet because this is a primary um, research. I, this is um, the first stage of the research. So this is just from my observation of going on the ground and see doing the field work and see and you know interview people related to you know industries and businesses and see how they think about the rel um, sorry the the highway in general. So this is what I did, um, extract from the ADB paper, uh, the East West Economic Corridor. It was launched in GMS Ministerial meeting in Manila in 1998. So everyone probably have heard about that. 
it was initiated by ADB, of course, because the report itself that talks about the potentials and the development in this um, areas all come from ADB. It's sponsored by ADB, JICA, and JPEG. So the road from Malamyang to Da Nang was actually you know, planned by ADB itself and sponsored by all of these Japanese organizations with some of the exception of the road from um, Malam, uh, Myowadi to Gorakek, which was sponsored by the Thai government and it was already finished. Um, the, but pretty much very short in a very short distance, but very good, very high quality road though, but with short distance. Um, this uh, east-west economic corridor, or what I will call an R9, ex extends 1,320 kilometers as a continuous land route connecting the Andaman Sea in the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. So basically, uh, the reason behind this is to connect the port in Malam Yang to the port in the Nang. So now you have like a land route connecting two ports in Southeast Asia. One actually could lead to the Indian Ocean to the west, and one could lead to the South China Sea, which is in the east. We're not talking about the real capability of it yet, but this is on the plan, right? Malang Yang, if you go to Malang Yang, you would see a port that actually could support only you know, fisheries, not really a big industry. But this is on the plan, which we really don't know how long would it take to accomplish that. Um, so the R9 highway uh, is important according to the ADB plan um, because it's a commercial knot. It actually connects a lot of you know towns that had commercial potential, uh, trade potential. In the West, you have Malam Yang, Miawadi. Miawadi is already the special economic zone. You see a lot of industries um, has been going on there. Masa Pisnulo Kongen, right, which is going to be sort of the center of the um, northeastern part of Thailand. Galasin Mukdahan, and then you have on the Lao side, Savan the K, Dan Savan, and then uh, Lao uh, Bao, Dong Ha, and Hue, and Da Nang on Vietnam side. Uh, it's also the gateways that I, uh, the gateways to different parts of the world, as I already told you. It connects to the Indian Ocean and South China Sea, Da Nang and Malam Yang. Uh, interchange knots because it actually connects to, some part of it actually connects to, uh, connects to um, north-south connectivity, north-south highway. And also border knots, you see, you know, border areas of these countries. So this is actually look very nice on the paper. It's going to be like the real trade potential, um, investment potential of these, these regions. But what I've actually seen is that, well, first of all, I will show you some of the pictures from the trip to get you, you know, some views that how it is actually on the ground. Uh, basically, these transport connections, so this east-west economic corridor, is planned as sort of industrial zone. So they want to e develop the industries around the area, surrounding this area. Tourism industry is mentioned, but it's actually not a priority. It actually wants to develop it to industrial side more than you know tourist industries. However, on the east side of the east-west corridor, what I have observed is that it's not really, it has not much industrialized. Uh, tourist industry is still being prioritized in this area, not by plan, but by reality. So the action on the ground has been trans, you know, transferred to, to this um, tourist industry. So let me show you a little bit of how it is on the ground along, you know, the road from Mukdahan to Da Nang. So um, Mukdahan, I don't really have picture from Mukdahan, but it's quite quiet. I would say it's not a big city or anything. Given that it's actually planned as you know a port, um, the border area that you know gateway to um, Laos and Vietnam. You don't really see anything going on. I have gone to the the one thing that so they so call a Indo Indo China market in Mukdahan, right? It's actually on the um, underground. Uh, not very fancy. So they call they just sell like local stuff. A lot of goods actually come from Vietnam, uh, and the goods from Vietnam actually come from this R9 highway. And it's probably the only thing that I observe that see you know the transport of goods, the 
free flow of goods in this area. Uh, Mukdahan has trade deficit right now. Um, before this, we had surplus. Now we have trade be um, benefits because we do import a lot of goods from Vietnam. Um, after we have this R9 highway and the new um, bridge across the river, uh, you will see a lot of shops in Mukdahan that sell Vietnamese goods from Vietnam. It's actually not Vietnamese goods. Some of them are actually from China, from Vietnam, but because the cost of production is lower, so they can probably benefit more, um, get more profit from selling goods from, from Vietnam. So, but it's pretty quiet, right? And on the weekend, you probably see people from Laos, um, Laos coming to Mukdahan, but they don't really use the bridge, like across the river. Um, they just like come here by, by boats. So you will see that R9 does not really, you know, change Mukdahan much. Um, as I would say, it actually has changed Laos more than um, Mukdahan. So this picture is actually from Savan Seno Special Trade and Economic Zone, um, Special Economic Zone. Uh, this is actually the front of the industrial park. Uh, we are not allowed to go in, and we were already warned that because we were carrying cameras all around rat Laos, it's actually not, um, it's not actually a, a very safe place for people to just travel and you know record places, take picture of places. But we managed to sneak in like a tourist, and then we took a photo of the um, the industrial park. We were not allowed to go in because we, we were supposed to have an appointment before we could go in. So within these um, uh, industrial parks, there are a lot of com com industries, companies from Laos itself, and a lot from South, um, South Korea as well. So Laos has become sort of the uh, hub for producing um, automobile parts from, North, uh, from South Korea, excuse me, not North Korea, South Korea, right? And um, you will see this Dehan, which is also, I believe it's a part of Hyundai, um, producing the, um, the automobile parts for, for Hyundai. So Hyundai is actually a big business in this area. They come in a cluster, right? So they actually produce pretty much parts and um, f not really finishing cars yet, but the parts in this area. Uh, you see Laos, especially Savannakit is actually trying to develop itself into an industrial area. And the strategy actually differ from, you know, towns or, or provinces to provinces because a Lao province has given authority to actually launch their own strat development strategy. And Savannakit has actually set itself as an industrial zone. Right, they actually wanted to do some part of duty free zone, you know, two, three years ago. There was in the newspaper. Uh, when I was there, I was kind of talking or asking the, the Thai diplomat about, you know, the development of the project. He said it was not really stable because, because you know, you can probably launch it one day and not implement it, and it has always been like that in Laos. Uh, but in general, the roads and the highway, the R9 in Laos is already mm, higher than my expectation because the ADB has already fixed the roads and right now, you know, it can actually handle all the big trucks um, going through this R9 highway. So um, I would say because of the R9, the, uh, the R9 highway established in Lao, Lao will actually benefit a lot from it because now it can, you know, travel to the other countries that have, you know, um, uh, channel to, to, to the other ports, um, countries. But these is, their, their, their products are not actually going to the Nam as planned. It's actually come into Thailand and go to Lam Chabang instead. So you see the plan actually said the R9 highway is planned as, um, you know, as a, a road towards Da Nang or Malam Yang, right? But because the cap capability of the ports itself is probably not as high as as planned before, uh, the goods from Laos, of course, now can find a way to export to other countries, but not through Vietnam yet. Some of it from to, through Vietnam, but most of the goods come to Thailand and travel to Lam Chabang. So it's not on R9. 
It's actually used other roads in order to travel to the port area. So if you travel further, you will find Laobao, right? Um, so this area has been set as kind of a special economic and trade zone. So in this area, you will see this is kind of that we'll call it department store. It's a it's actually a coordination between Thai, Mukdahan province, not even Thailand, only the Mukdahan province and the Alaobao area. And they set up this department store and then they, you know, import goods from Thailand and sell in this department store. Plus, in this area, you'll be able to um, buy cars free of, it's tax free, duty free. Uh, but you will be able to drive the car only up to Hue and Da Nang. So only in three provinces only that um, the car uh, bought in Laobao area will be allowed to travel. So from what I imply, it probably going to support the industries though, that does not want to travel further to other areas, right? The trucks and the cars that only uh, transport goods from these areas to Da Nang, which is a port area. So this is not to facilitate, you know, citizens or people, but rather to facilitate um, companies that want to invest in these areas. So this is a department store that I was talking about earlier, Mukdahan and Thailand supermarket, but on the Vietnam border. So not actually, not even in Laos, in Vietnam territory. Uh, you travel further, you will see Dong Ha. Dong Ha is actually bigger than I thought because Dong Ha is actually the hub of, of trade, the trade hub. Um, it actually uh, it import and export a lot of locks, woods from, from Laos and export into other areas. So Dong Ha is actually you know, more developed than I thought. You see a lot of trucks traveling, coming, you know, coming into the town, coming out of the town in Dong Ha area. The roads are fabulous. Right, so very high quality, you can expect trucks to drive on it, right? So this is Dong Ha area. You see a lot of hotel as well. I talked to my friends who traveled along this highway several years ago, he said Dong Ha has nothing. Now you see a lot of hotels popping up in, in Dong Ha. So I could see that it can possibly be a trading hub um, in the near future. But, well, I skip Hue because Hue is a um, historical site and it does not allow for more development in that area because you have to preserve it as it is, right? But after you, you know, across the mountain, right? Hue is on the one side of the mountain, you cross the mountain to Da Nang. You see metropolitan area. I went to Da Nang um, three, four years ago. It was not as developed as today. So this is actually... Um, the high, this high-rise building is not a condominium, right? It's um, actually the, uh, all of the Vietnamese authorities and the offices are in this building, in, in Da Nang. They centralized everything to this building. I try to ask the reason, the reason I got, which is not verified yet, but I think it's probably reliable, uh, is because um, this six or seven years, uh, there are more tourists coming to Da Nang and Da Nang cannot handle the numbers of tourists anymore so they need land to build more hotels and these lands um, previously belonged to all of these official buildings so they kind of they sold all of these they, they get, got rid of all of these official buildings all of the offices moved to this building make it more centralized and other areas were that were previously office buildings official buildings are now hotels that can probably uh, you know service more give more service to to tourists in this area now Da Nang is kind of diverse and I don't really know what Da Nang really wants to move into yet because Da Nang wants to be the IT hub right it has a building you know contributes to this software industries uh, da Nang is also the third largest port in Vietnam after Ho Chi Minh and Haiphong, right? Da Nang is also a tourist destination, and Da Nang also has industrial zone. So Da Nang actually wants to be everything. Actually, it reminds me of some part of Thailand, um, Chiang Rai, actually wants to be like this too. It's a tourist hub, wants to actually cultivate its tourist industry, it actually wants to be ports too, and it wants to build industrial zone as well. So this actually the contradiction happens everywhere in Southeast Asian countries. It does not really have 
a plan of what it wants to actually develop the, the countries or, or the provinces into. So this is the industrial zone. It's, a, it's not very large, um, but there are a lot of, uh, well, industries in this area, very, you know, um, what do you call it? The, the heavy industry in this area. Um, this is the port, the Nang port. It's far away. My camera is not good enough to zoom in. But they have like kind of fishery port, which is smaller, and then industrial port, which is larger at the far back. Um, now, what do they export? They transport mostly garments from, from and to China, and um, woods and lots. Uh, because as I know, if you want to talk about production chain, as what ADB really wanted to be, they want to create production chain in this area. I can see the very clear production, the clearest production chain in this area is paper industry, paper making industry, right? So you actually import locks and woods from Laos. You um, kind of uh, produce the 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 you 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 change the form of it. You know, I don't know how to say it. Um, in Vietnam, and then you export like this small small woods and kind of stuff to China, and then China make it into paper. So this is a very clear industry, um, the production chain in this area. Uh, this is a software park that I told you. It wants to be IT park, but you could not really go in without making an appointment. I tried to sneak in um, and count the number of the IT um, companies in this building. It's kind of it's more than 60 companies from many places, mostly Japan, and um, some German companies as well. Uh, but it's actually very stressful though, you know, like traveling in, in Vietnam and tries to get the information because you are prohibited not going anywhere so we can try just to sneak in and try to get information as much as we can otherwise we won't really get anything from it so uh, I need to conclude it right okay so um, so those are what actually I've observed this is my interpretation so this is what actually imply so ADB really want to transform this R9 from a transport corridor so the corridor that you know facilitate only trucks, people, movement of people, to economic corridor. So three things they want to achieve. They want to achieve trade liberalization, right? They want to uh, simplify all the custom um, regulations. They want to creating production chain. Thirdly, they want to support supporting the tourism industry. The last one actually came in automatically. So you don't really need to invest. CP has already going to uh, Laos to you know build this golf park and stuff like that. Um, but the, the the enforcing the trade liberalization and creating production chain is actually they wanted to do. But what I've seen so far, there are many you know obstacles in these areas. First, very slow pace of implementation. Now, ADB really want to create this cross-border transport agreement, or TBT, uh, CBTA. That will create a common control area. Uh, you can imagine that. So basically, if you go to Lao Bao, you will see the uh, Vietnamese and the Lao officers sit next side by side. So you can actually, you know, you got the stamp, right? You got the stamp from Laos, and then you got the another stamp from Vietnamese ofi officials right away, and then you go through, right? And then they, they're gonna do this um, system or this process also for trade, for all the trucks as well. But right now it's just for people, right? Um, the, the agreement has actually agreed at the same time with Thailand as well. Uh, Thailand has not implemented that yet. So in the case of Thailand, if you want to cross the border from Thailand to Laos, get a stamp at the border in Thailand, you, you walk, you know, 2000, not 2000, 200 meters, and they've got another stamp. So it's, you know, it's like very complicated process. Uh, and uh, talking to the diplomat, uh, he actually said there is no plan of, you know, kind of implement it on the Thai side yet. 
And plus, um, Thai views on the ADBs are nine. I'm not sure if I can probably say it, but I don't think it's very positive because we believe it's actually ADB's project and Thailand does not have to, you know, help with it much. So you see the slow pace of implementation, uh, especially in the case of Thailand with the bureaucratic system and the politics in Thailand, it's very unstable. So you don't really know what's going on uh, according to the plan. No available support for medium and small enterprises. What, why do I say this? I, saw, I say this because uh, although you see a lot of industries going in Laos, Thai industries, Thai companies as well, going to Laos and Vietnam, all these companies are MNCs. So they are huge companies like CP or S, uh, SDG, right? And these companies are going into Laos and Vietnam not because of the R9 highway. They are going there anyway. They have capability to actually explore the lands. They have connection there. So they're going in there without the help of, you know, the R9 highway. The R9 highway probably facilitates them a little bit, transport faster, but it's not the reason why they go and invest in that country. Uh, R9 is supposed to actually facilitate um, the SMEs or, you know, smaller people on the ground more to, you know, go and invest in other countries. Cannot do that right now because, as you know, you might need connection in both Laos and Vietnam in order to establish companies. And SMEs do not really have that capability yet. Uh, you saw, and, and if you talk about development, you cannot ignore people, right? Uh, people would probably enjoy more benefit, but working in large companies. So you can see the labor rights is not, you know, well protected. Uh, they don't really get a very big salaries in these companies. They probably have more job opportunity, but not the higher level of job opportunity. They don't have capability to invest in their own businesses, um, just work for these big companies. Have invert trade flows, as I, as I said to you, come to Bangkok and go to Lam Chibang instead of going to Vietnam. So challenges, uh, I say lack of political will or pretty much very slow process. Um, although you have signed a lot of documents, you don't really see the implementation. And as I mentioned to you, right, uh, the Thai diplomat already said that, well, it's ADB's project, right? It's not our priority. So how would actually, you, how can you expect the connectivity in ASEAN to be true, right? And when the government itself has not actually worked hard on it. Um, lack of planning of development strategy, as I already told you, you want to be everything. You want to be a hub, you want to be an IT hub, you want to be port, you want to be industrial zone. What do you want to be? This happens everywhere, not only in Vietnam or in Laos, it happens in Thailand too. We don't have a clear strategy of development or, or um, areas. Lack of collaborative plan. This does not only happen in, you know, across international level, it happens within domestic level as well. For example, in the case of Laos, um, the, the point of building Another bridge, also, you know, on the other hand, it could facilitate more trade flows. On another hand, on the other hand, though, it's also because two provinces cannot negotiate with each other. So, um, uh, Salovin, for example, wants to um, have a road connection to Thailand, does not have a bridge yet. It talked to other provinces that has a bridge connection to Thailand. Those provinces say no. So that's why, you know, it has to seek more investment from, from Japan in order to build another bridge. So you see lack of collaboration, you know, don't have clear strategy. Uh, you don't really facilitate people on the ground. And I would say uh, overall ASEAN in itself and, you know, R9 include, included, um, the collaboration has been pushed forward by uh, capital, not really the government. So that's why if you see, you know, Capitalists want to invest invest in those countries. You see, you know, facility come up after them. Uh, so com big companies will definitely benefit from these because they have capability. I don't see much opportunity from for, for the people in the areas to enjoy the development in you know on the ground. So that will be my presenta presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm the last uh, presentation, and as uh, Dr. Tiffany asked me to make my presentation in as uh, short as possible, and I hope that we can finish in time, and you have a good lunch over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah.
Um, today I come here to talk about Vietnamese and Thailand cooperation in responding to climate change. Uh, as you know, climate change is uh, uh, hot and uh, quite difficult issue at the moment. Uh, in recent decades, the weather and climate have become increasingly complex and unpredictable. Natural disasters have been more incentive and loss, heavy loss and lives and property negatively impact on social and economic development. Cause of not, uh, natural uh, disaster and numbers, according to the many experts, one of the main reasons is climate change. And you can see um, the impact of climate change focus on the three, um, yeah, they cause um, three main impact, uh, sea level rise, the natural uh, disaster, and extremely weather. Uh, leading to the loss of biodiversity, uh, conflict, war, and especially on the safety and security of people. And you can see the change of uh, natural disaster um, over the year. And the, in the light, orange light is a uh, natural disaster change in Southeast Asia study, and you can see the increasing day by day. By day. Yeah. Besides uh, the um, uh, impact, economic impact on the every country in the world, especially in Southeast Asia countries, uh, the natural disaster uh, caused many deaths uh, of people, and this fear of escapes. And you can see the Southeast Asia in the um, or orange column as very very big. And uh, for Thailand and Vietnamese, uh, we quite the same uh, natural disaster focus on flood and drought. And uh, in uh, uh, 2011 floods in Thailand, yes, it is a um, map uh, of uh, flood in Bangkok. You can see it, and the um, uh, citizen. Um, uh, Living, uh, living on the water for a long day, and more than more than fifty hundred people are died in uh, this flood, and uh, twelve million people affected. And I, I think you are in Bangkok, and you see and feel very clearly of this flood from Vietnam, for example, in the very um, near. Uh, early uh, to, uh, 2016 drought and solidization in Vietnam, in um, southern Vietnam. Yeah. Uh, no water for, for, for drought and the drought clear, all clear. The experts said that uh, the um, uh, animal and climate change, uh, animal climate change and uh, water uh, management in the Mainstream of Mekong River Delta is caused the uh, is a main reason for this uh, drought, and um, uh, you can see um, the impact is very uh, very hard for people for citizen um, to, to cover the damage of it, and I think Vietnam and Thailand have uh, quite the same damage, so we should. Uh, have corporate uh, uh, cooperation in corporate climate change. Uh, in fact, uh, the cooperation uh, uh, in climate change of Vietnam and Thailand focus in two frameworks: the first multilateral framework and bilateral framework. Uh, for the multilateral framework, uh, in, um, ASEAN cooperation is more positively and is is mainstreamed cooperation in the few of uh, climate change between two countries faced with the uh, challenges of uh, climate change regional uh, uh, cooperation have ne uh, uh, become so urgent. Uh, cooperation are the key for ASEAN to solve all challenges related to climate change. It's uh, only um, focus on AC, uh, um, uh, blueprint, and um, Thailand and Vietnam 
are two countries actively supporting uh, initiative of Vietnam on climate change, uh, and uh, the other the other frameworks of cooperation such as GMS, MX, Mekong uh, Mekong River Commission, and Mekong Lan Kang. Uh, it's very new Mekong Lan Kang cooperation. And as you see, GMS and IMF is focused much more on um, uh, economic uh, cooperation. But besides economic, they have uh, uh, mentioned uh, about uh, environment, uh, protect environment, NCC, because environment uh, NCC, uh, and uh, climate change is very important for, to support uh, for development of uh, economic. And uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, framework is very important for Mekong with the uh, Mekong River Commission. But in this framework, uh, China and Malaysia do not enjoy it. And until now, um, MRC is the most positive uh, mechanism to support, uh, to, uh, to give many uh, uh, support for improve um, Mekong River Delta. And uh, a new newest um, corporation is the Mekong Line Khang, uh, uh, in which uh, include China, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Vietnam. And uh, five fields to strength cooperation include water, uh, connecting product cap uh, capacity, economic cooperation across border, agriculture, poverty reduction, and I think that uh, in this um, framework, the downstream countries uh, such as Laos, Thailand, Vietnam uh, should not closely tied um, to, to, uh, pro uh, to um, give a plan uh, for water management. And you can see this uh, system camped on Mekong mainstream. Uh, as you see in the, in the act here, uh, we have uh, China finished six dam, and they have two dam in plan, and Laos have one dam under construction, and uh, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam have no dam in the mainstream. They have only dam in the river bank, and you can see in the right picture here. You see in the uh, in the dam they have made a lot of water. But under, in the downstream, uh, we have uh, uh, less water. And um, uh, the, the experts uh, said that without silt, uh, scale of silt, that makes the uh, land of uh, Delta singing. Uh, it's one of the reasons that uh, Bangkok uh, is uh, flooded very heavily. Yeah. And uh, about the cooperation with the bilateral framework, uh, we can see that uh, until now, uh, the bilateral framework of Thailand and uh, Vietnam in uh, corporate uh, climate change is uh, not time. Uh, uh, luckily, in the nearly in June in this year, um, uh, the ambassador, uh, Thailand ambassador in Vietnam, gave a uh, donate uh, for Vietnam uh, one thousand. 100,000 US dollars uh, to support the job in uh, southern Vietnam. I think it's uh, the, um, the, the small uh, corporation, but it, it's a formal corporation, the first formal corporation. And I hope that uh, in uh, next time, Thailand and Vietnam, we have more and more cooperation in coping with uh, climate change. And uh, for, for the future, uh, I, in my opinion, suggest that. Um, Thailand and Vietnam should be continuing effort to implement uh, the commitment to make the, uh, in ASEAN to make ASEAN have enough uh, capacity to cope with the climate change and uh, cooperate with the closely in uh, to, uh, together in uh, framework of Mekong cooperation communism. Yeah, and Thailand and Vietnam need to set up. Uh, they are efforts using um, friendly uh, technology and think about the uh, carbon market. Uh, do you know in the COP21, uh, uh, carbon market is a 
one of the method to uh, reduce uh, the carbon uh, in uh, process uh, of production. And uh, the, the last, I think it is uh, very important, is the sharing information and experience in talk with climate change, such as uh, in um, uh, 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 Ho Chi Minh City, uh, usually we are in flood and Bangkok is the same. And I think we can um, share and learn uh, experience each other to know how to deal with this problem. Yeah, it's my presentation and thank you. Let me open the floor to uh, questions and comments. Uh, the floor is open. Uh, I thought maybe I, I would pick up from uh, Dr. Uh, Wall, right? the, uh, 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 the last speaker, in terms of um, climate change. Of course, you know one of the important impact of climate change is on water, yeah, or water availability. And as you know, you know Mekong, as you mentioned, is uh, probably one of the important shared transboundary waters. And of course, it's right now getting to be increasingly contested space or resource. Maybe to me, it, it is, I'm, I'm closely following the South China Sea because that's also another shared international transboundary water resource, except that's of salt water. And here we're talking about fresh water. And to me, this one is actually more important because you're having at least 60, 80 million people livelihoods depending on it. Uh, okay, South China Sea is also important for another purpose, uh, but at least it's very sparsely populated there. Whereas this one has very severe impact, I mean, like, like your drought in the Mekong Delta has, has, has shown. So I think we have to talk about regime for management of transboundary shared waters, whether it's in the sea or in the, in the, in, on the river. Uh, okay, you can talk about, uh, I, I won't talk about the South China Sea as I'm not too uh, familiar about that, but uh, on, the, on the fresh water, I think Vietnam is the only country, or one of the few countries that have signed to the International Water Cost Convention back in 2004. And that caused that convention to come into effect, yeah? Um, very little other countries. I mean, ASEAN, I, as far as I know, no other ASEAN country has signed on. Uh, of course, this is an international agreement, just like climate change and other things. So I would be interested to hear what is Vietnam's take on this? Apparently, you have taken the lead to sign an international convention on water. Obviously, we understand the reasons behind it. Um, should there be an effort to encourage others to do so? Uh, if that would work, you know, uh, I presume that's your original intention. Uh, and then how do we do it? I mean, we have the Mekong River Commission. Uh, it's sort of half effective, shall we say, I mean, to give it credit to. But on the other hand, we also know its, it's problems and constraints. So is there some other alternative mechanism? Is Lanchang Mekong, which is now proposed, sort of driven by China, a more better mechanism or not? Thank you. OK, we'll take that uh, as a question and comment. Uh, the, the regional framework for water resource management, the Mekong River Commission has been uh, not really that effective. Uh, it has tried, but because China is not really part of it, uh, this is uh, its main shortcoming. At the same time now, I think the Lan Chang Mekho Summit has overtaken all other agreements. And if you don't play by that game, by those rules you know, from the Lan Chang Mekho framework, I don't think China will participate. This is analogous to also the South China Sea. China wants to be the one who determines the rules. If you don't play, if you have your own rules, they don't play with the, by your rules. They have their rules, would you play their rules? I have read paper by the Chinese side who have argued very fiercely that uh, the Chinese is only use 1% of Ran Chang Mekong water. They also argue strongly that only 4% of Ran Chang. The water flows that come from China is only 13.5% of water flowing to the sea from Mekong. The dam can only keep 30% of the water while 70% flow naturally down anyway. And ESCAP have argued that the Chinese dam was not the reason for drought for Mekong region, and the dam helped manage water anyway. This is the Chinese argument in essence that I took notes and I read. So I want to hear your reaction because I want to know what is the truth? Is the, the Chinese uh, Three Gorges and the dam, has it really affected 
the Mekong countries or not, including Thailand, Laos, uh, Cambodia, and so on, Vietnam. That's my, my first question to you. I apologize if I did not hear you fully because I went out to give an interview. And I want to ask a second question if, uh, to our Thai speaker, uh, Ajahn, that Mot Lamang, someone reported to me who wanted to try to develop a port in Mot Lamang and said that it's so primitive there. It had absolutely no potential to become a harbor of some sort for a long, long time. And therefore, the project is going to be in a nebulous world. What is your reaction to that in, uh, in what you have observed? Thank you. I know those figures. Uh, the workshop we had earlier, uh, those figures were presented by, our, you know, by, by, by a paper presenter and they were refuted by our Vietnamese presenter. So I'll, I'll leave it to the, our Vietnamese colleagues to, to react to that. Uh, what do you think about those numbers? They're only using like 1% and more than 70% actually flows down. No, I, I'm not responding to the question, but uh, I would like to have, add a question to the uh, Ajahn. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Um, Dr. Wong, would you say anything about this? Uh, uh, water resource management in terms of the, re the regulation, regulatory framework, and also the Chinese upstream dams. Uh, how much of an impact is it really uh, that adverse, uh, or is it just uh, minimal and uh, can be coped with? Yeah, um, thank you uh, for the coming in question. Uh, as you see, and uh, Mekong River Benta is a very big problem now, and because it, it depends on the country interest. Uh, as you can see, um, China and Myanmar on the top. And Vietnam, now Cambodia, and uh, um, in the downstream. And if uh, China said that they build tent uh, to help downstream uh, downstream country to um, protect the flood, you see, China said that. But in fact, we see uh, drought in Vietnam, flood in Thailand no fish in Cambodia and many nobody and uh, no country in Laos and uh, no country in Cambodia, Vietnam and Thailand built the dam in the mainstream. Only China and the next is the Laos. And when Laos built dam, many Thai people down to the street to against this project. I think it is um, it is a can we can now say the what is a um, uh, good uh, solution for this situation? But in fact, uh, uh, Vietnam and Thailand and Cambodia, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I uh, ask Chinese. Ask. <laughs> I can stall the um, cam, and you can see. Yeah, uh, because uh, the um, China want to control this Mekong River Delta, and the uh, downstream don't want. But the China has the right. It, in fact, in New York, they have the right to build the dam, and if other country want to uh, uh, pro protect their interest and they need to closely tie to give the invoice. As you know, in, um, um, in Mekong Railroad Commission, Cambodia and uh, Myanmar do not join. At that time, this commission is the uh, most active, uh, active uh, um, in the Mekong River program. And I think the, the question is uh, how we sit together and to work together to uh, you know, set that to China should be stopped uh, and can new tent because in fact the um, China have planned 50, 15 dams in the mainstream and 
at that time, they have solid stick. See, it's very, very dangerous for the, 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 the un, uh, downstream. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I can add more uh, for the answer related to the Mekong River. Uh, here is um, about the uh, Chinese source related to the uh, uh, small percent of water uh, coming from China. Uh, actually, uh, I have uh, a question on the uh, reliability of the salt that uh, China gives. That is the first. The second is that uh, the importance of the upstream. The upstream is very important. Although you uh, hold a very uh, small uh, amount of water, but it is really important in the period of drought or flood. If it drought, you keep it. So, little bit water coming together, and uh, when the you know that when the flood, flooding is there, and if you give more money, uh, give, give more water, so things getting there. So, so, so that is problem, because the upstream is very important, and that uh, I I want to get uh, to uh, the question of, uh, of uh, her, and uh, my come with a question to the, uh, okay, and the question for I can. Uh, here, uh, I have two questions. The first is uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, there's a lack of information that you got from Vietnam. And how did you uh, get information? Do you contact with the uh, authority of the local or not? Uh, and the second question is that also related to the uh, doctor, uh, their questions. That is about the uh, possibility of the long term development of East West Corridor. Because uh, as I learned, uh, from the uh, deport in Myanmar, it's quite small, and also uh, quite small. And it's, it's, I think that it's very uh, small uh, potential for the future development. So uh, could we you know, focus more on the uh, southern economic uh, corridor from Ho Chi Minh City to Bangkok to that way, or connecting the East West Corridor to the, the South uh, economic corridor? Okay, I think a couple of questions, few questions actually for Chan Bong Quan. Uh, first, you, how you get your information in uh, Vietnam. I think you said it was actually prohibited. Uh, and then the question about Molomat, the, the cost effectiveness, uh, how feasible it is, not just Molomat, but also the way to why. Uh, you know, we have, have been banking on uh, constructing these deep sea ports. Uh, well, first, the way has a lot, uh, some, some investments have been made, but hasn't gone very far, and Molomat, not yet. Is it, is it too primitive or too, too low, too lower base? Um, so with regard, with regard to that uh, question first, we didn't contact with any authority. So first of all, we tried to observe what actually happened on the ground, right? And um, fortunately, at Da Nang, our translator uh, was a business person in and tourist industry. So we got a lot of information regarding the tourism industry from him. Um, apart from that, we didn't really make any contact with the Vietnamese authority. Uh, what we did was we are uh, observing and we talk to people on the ground. So um, for example, uh, when we went to the CPF um, company, the, 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 the factory, we talked to um, workers when it was after the the industry was closed after the work time so they were out in the market and we were talking to them so our information is not on the top down it's more bottom up all right uh, with regard to malam 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 yang malam Meng, right uh, so when i travel from taan to malam yang i actually took a boat so just like this this boat it took like four hours to Malam Yang because we want I wanted to observe the port there. Uh, so you can see, I I I didn't upload the the photo of the port, but um I could tell you that they are all fishery boats, so not a very large ship or anything. And this is the entrance, like this a small entrance. This is an entrance to the port. So maybe maybe. From the photo, it can actually tell you that it's very primitive. Um, 
if I if they want to build a, a new port, it's going to be a very large project because I think the length or or um, the the river is not wide enough. They probably have to dig more. This is actually what they are doing in the way as well because uh, if you actually go into the way right now. You won't see anything unless you can tap with the authority, and then they come with the map, and then they show you this is going to be this in the way. Uh, I think I have a picture of the way as well. Um, but Malam Yang is urbanizing though. It's it's growing. It has the first super store in the town already. But you can see it's very contrasting because this is the market of Malam Yang. So, um, uh, let's see. So this is on the way to the way. So they're actually expanding roads, but this it's still man-made. So, you know, it's not very smooth. The roads are not very smooth. Um, so this is the way already, sorry. Uh, okay. This is the place where they are going to build the Dawei um, deep sea port. So you can see there is nothing there yet, right? You could probably see the map here. Uh, that's the map. It's going to be this place going to look like this. But you won't see anything close to what it looks on the map yet. So it's very underdeveloped now. Um, Jan Bong Kwan, may I ask you a direct question? If you have the Thailand to marry Mok Lam Meng or marry the way, which one we should choose if we have to choose one and why? Oh. <laughs> or either, or, or is it worth it? It's very a tough it's it's a very tough question. Um, but if you start from this point, I would say the way because you have already invested in that already. Right, you have this is the um, industrial park. So you have already, you know, cleared the land. You have already set up um, some of the industries for, you know, um, producing cement to, you know, kind of build the industrial parks. So there, it's cost there. So you you could probably have to continue with it. Um, if it's good idea or not, I'm actually not sure. You know, the initiative itself because of why because uh mm, maybe no more but anyway um because without the railway right now right you can see on the malam yang side you can probably connect through through roads you know through pan through um Miwadi and then to mesa right the road it's, prop it's not well constructed, but it's not too bad. On the other side, on the other hand, on the way side, there are roads, but you have to drive through I don't know how many mountains. On the way back to Thailand, I took a local van. So there, you know, the scheduled van. It, I didn't rent my own, own van. So it took me six hours from the way to Kanchanaburi. And the road was not that good at all. I could, I could, I could imagine even if with roads being constructed, you are going to have going, you're going to have a lot of accidents on the road because it's mountainous areas. Uh, the only one way for you to actually minimize the cost of transportation using, you know, road in this area is that you have to construct, you have to build it through mountains. I think that's the only way to for for you know trucks to drive on that road safely and the railway as well. You probably have to build it through the mountains. Was this the road that uh, Ito Thai built? Was yeah, but it's only it's still mud uh -huh. roads. Uh -huh. So yeah, so from your slide, you know the uh, the master plan of the way, and what you actually saw and took a photo of, it looks like it's less than five percent there. Yeah, they are actually on the first, on the first stage of the A phase. So not even the B phase. I, mean, I, uh, I think I, if I can remember well, they have three phases, A, B, and C. Now they are on the A phase. 
and the first stage of the A phase. So they have already built the worker facility, so they have the, the apartment for the worker already, but only the models, the first one, has already constructed. And then there are no, in, no factories there. Uh, I think there are two factories that, that told uh, Ital Italian Thai that they are ready to build the factories, but they haven't started. So that, that land, that clear land, is actually the industrial park. You can't imagine because there's nothing there, but it's going to be the industrial park. Another problem, though, is because the transition in Myanmar itself, Aung San, um, Aung San Suu Kyi's government has not agreed to anything yet. So the, the project is putting at halt right now, waiting for the agreement with Aung San Suu Kyi, and then they can probably proceed with it. Yeah, the dilemma for us, it looks like, is uh, the sunk costs are accumulating. And after a while, you know, it is, uh, it's not worth um, pulling out, uh, cutting your losses. Uh, I'm not sure which, at which point that will be, but uh, it's going in that direction. Okay, uh, questions, comments from the floor? Um, we'll take one from senior fellow of ISIS, uh, Gwen Robertson. It's just a quick question. Uh, the Chinese government has said that Zone and it's uh, sorry, it's not my um, subject, but uh, I think in um, Vietnam, as uh, as uh, my knowledge, uh, Vietnamese Vietnamese government have many priorities for the enterprise in economic. Uh, as no, uh, for example, the. Um, Electric price uh, in the economic zone is uh, lower than uh, 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 electric price uh, for the citizen in Vietnam, and um, many many priority uh, policies for uh, the um, uh, enterprise invest in the economic zone uh, because uh, Viet Vietnam government want to attract uh, the capital to build uh, uh, economic zone. Uh, uh, in the um, because as you know, Vietnam lacked the capital uh, to, uh, for development, so we um, give many priority policy, investment policy, trade policy, tax, and um, uh, from the um, 2050 uh, Vietnam uh, 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 Asia Committee is built uh, with IEC, and we have many. Um, economic priority for the ASEAN country, and uh, I think if uh, the foreigner invest uh, the e-commerce zone, is uh, get more benefit than other. Yeah, thank you. So I've heard that the Lao feel that they've become a transit area between Thailand and Vietnam, and that they're not really benefiting from this connectivity that's been developed, and also related to that. Uh, you said, uh, Dr. Wen, I believe, that the labor agreements so far focus on fishing and construction, but when I was up in Udon Thani and, at the Chinese New Year, I heard that there are a lot of domestic workers who are coming from Vietnam, and is there any thought about looking at um, ways that those people might be aided too? Um, Laos, I think there are two levels of answers to that. Um, if you're, I think the, you know, like business persons, all the people uh, in business, they probably enjoy that though because they can now transport their goods to ports, which they don't have, right? So they certainly enjoy that. Um, 
for people on the ground, I don't think they have that feeling much of you know the being transit area, given that now they have uh, you know places more job opportunities coming into the country. I, I'm talking about Samanakit in particular, but however, although they probably have more job opportunity, doesn't mean that they would fully benefit from it though. They have more job opportunities, but working in factories, right? They probably get more tourists, but you, you can say tourists are also like tourists in transit. They are going to Vietnam, but still they have to spend time in Laos for at least one night before they can go to Vietnam. So they get tourists from that, you know, the, the, those people who want to go to Da Nang as well. But also, they also get tourists from Thailand going directly to Sobanaket to go to temples as well. Although it's very low season, couple of years, um, they have said to me, and I was like, yeah, definitely, we're broke, right? We ran out of money, so why would we go travel? Um, but yeah, I don't, I, I haven't, ask them much about that, but this is the sense that I get from talking from, to locals. Doesn't seem that they feel like that we are just a transit area. Enjoy, they enjoy some economic benefit. They see the sea development, uh, they say the sea development roads are getting better, but still I can see that most of the job opportunities remain in factories. Thank you very much. Uh Look, I want to thank uh, everyone. I think we've learned a lot about Vietnam. It's almost like a new frontier, even though we're so close. You know, it's just an hour's fly away, but we have a lot more to learn about your country, and I think vice versa uh, at all levels. More students there, here, uh, and so on. And uh, I want to thank in particular Kun Kawi and then uh, uh, Professor So Wien. Thank you so much for collaborating, organizing this with us, and Dr. Hua, and all the speakers from Vietnam and from, from Thailand. Uh, to all of you, please join, join me in thanking all the speakers. It's been a productive conversation and we can continue the conversation over lunch. Please, uh, you're invited to lunch uh, just right outside.